This is Jim Hendershot again, uh, presenting uh, lecture number 13. This lecture covers the uh, insulation systems that are required for the stator phase windings for these three machines, and, and these uh, uh, the level of insulation is based on the temperature rec operating temperature requirements and the voltage requirements. Now, uh, grid machines are are designed. Uh, 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 some grid machines are uh, designed for generators are designed for ultra high voltages, uh, seventy thousand volts AC. But the motor uh, types discussed in these lectures are intended for inverter operation rather than uh, high voltage grid power or even battery power applications, so the voltages are much lower. The, uh, uh, the voltages for these motors are all based on the ratings of IGBT transistors. And uh, so, so the max voltages go to about uh, 2,800 volts. There's development work going on to extend this up to 8,000 volts. I don't know what the status is. It's not my expertise, but uh, ultra-high voltage uh, uh, machine insulation systems for grid power requires very special insulation materials, which we're not really going to discuss in this. But for the machines that we're going to talk about, we use enameled magnet wire for insulation of the magnet wire from conductor to conductor, turn to turn. And then uh, Nomax and Kapton slot liners, and then varnishing using VPI or trickle varnish techniques. Uh, trickle varnish is very uh, widely used for high volume motors. Seems to work well. A little uh, uh, preheating and then trickle the varnish out nozzles on the interns while you rotate the rotor or rotate the stator, and then the heat. And capillary action sucks the varnish into the uh, in between the conductors down the slots, and there's very little mess and cleanup with this. And for larger motors, they're all uh, 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 VPI uh, insulated. High voltage machines use these ultra high voltage machines uses mica and bakelite and various uh, thick slabs of insulation materials. The average dielectric strength of most insulation materials is at least uh, 1,000 volts per mil, and many of them are up as high as uh, 4,000 volts per mil. The uh, uh, motor voltage classes varies with vendors and countries, but uh, low voltage is uh, considered under 480 volts AC. Medium voltage is uh, 481 to 6,000 volts AC. High voltage 6,001 to 20,000, and ultra high voltage is 20,000 uh, to 70,000. Uh, simple, basic uh, considerations for insulation systems: the stator phase winding must be insulated against ground shorts and and turn to turn shorts. Uh, turn to turn shorts are insulated by uh, by the enamel coating on the conductor or higher voltage uh, they're done by the turn-to-turn -turn shorts are insulated by wrapping tape around the magnet wire. Uh, ground shorts are prevented by the slot insulation, slot liners and end boards. Slot liners are frequently cuffed uh, at each end similar to the uh, uh, the cuff of a, of a dress shirt collar so that uh, so that uh, the insulator stands up on these cuffs on the ends and eliminates the need for an end board and and then as long as the cuffs never get crushed by forming of the end windings that supports the end winding and keeps them off of the uh, uh, a, a, a distance away from the uh, end of the core equal to the height of the cuff the other method for lower voltage, which is a very popular system, is epoxy coating of uh, the stators using either electrostatic methods or or fluidizing methods. That's air aerated methods, and these epoxy coatings are are very good for thermal conductivity because uh, uh, they're in direct contact with the the steel core and the coils are usually in direct contact with the epoxy with minimum air gaps in between. So the thermal conductivity from the heat source from the uh, uh, ohmic losses in the windings is very good. 
there's there's very few air gap insulating uh, gaps. Uh, the other the other method that's used to insulate cores is uh, coil forms or or what's known as molded bobbins that go around one tooth or multiple teeth, and these these bobbins could be made out of uh, uh, they're commonly made out of nylon uh, uh, with glass filling in it, but but you can improve the thermal conductivity of those with putting some other uh, materials in them, like uh, aluminum oxide, something like that. Still a good insulator, but improves the thermal conductivity. And face shorts are prevented by uh, by extra insulation, added uh, added insulation. Uh, there's a uh, uh, you could take the slot liner material and cut it into strips and put it in between the, the, the phases in the slot and in the end turns you use uh, fiberglass sheets, woven fiberglass sheets of, uh, of uh, insulation material that you put between the end turns, uh, uh, the phases in the end turns so that you don't have big potential differences between phases. This is an excellent uh, picture of all these things that I just discussed, provided by Fabrico. They provided this kindly. Uh, they're a division of EIS, which is a distributor all over North America that distributes all these materials that you see in this uh, picture here, all different slot liner materials, lacing materials, and all sorts of, uh, of the components that you need to insulate a stator. As you can, there's a few things that are worth pointing out. Here's the slot liner right here. These don't have to have, have, to have cuffs on them, but they're longer than the core, so they still uh, keep the, the coils away from the, uh, the face of the core. Then, uh, then, uh, then you have, these are called top sticks or slot wedges that go over the top. That's to keep the conductors from coming out of the slots. Uh, the... Uh, the, obviously, these are the uh, the coils. The, these coils can be made up of uh, multiple uh, strands in parallel, or maybe single strand per turn. That could be just a lot of turns for a high voltage motor, or that could be a low number of turns with parallel strands. It looks like uh, if this is the lead coming out of it, it looks like there. It's a combination of both. It looks like there's several parallel strands per turn. This being a turn. And this is some sleeving that you would put over the the uh, pigtail when it's magnet wire coming out of here. It's called a pigtail. But then uh, you attach leads. Maybe, oh, I guess I guess this is not sleeving. That looks like that's uh, a lead wire that's been attached to it. What does it say here? A slot liner. Yeah, lead. Okay, that that is sleeving over the magnet wire, but that could be. Uh, hookup wire or heavier gauge lead wire could be soldered and crimped and, and attached to the magnet wire as well. Oh, there that shows the lead wire. Ah, there we go. So this is the pigtail of magnet wire, several strands per turn. See it there? And then somewhere that is soldered or crimped to a lead wire, which is multi-strand also, but it's it's heavier in gauge. And and so there's a there's the joint. A, with tape around it, of where the magnet wire was attached to the lead wire, and uh, and here's the phase separators I spoke about, and then this is a a uh, a strip that goes around here for bracing that uh, gives rigidity to this mass of interns. So if you if you wrap this bracing strip around here, and then you go through the lacing process of the tie cord. And, and it laces all these end turns and the leads and the pigtails to this bracing strip around the outside. Bigger machines, this will be laced to those, uh, those uh, to, to maybe a steel insulated ring that I showed you on one slide in the last lecture. Or, or it can be attached to uh, steel blades that have been welded to the end of the core to s support these end turns. So, uh, the here's the, some blown up details of the slot insulation. Here you have a sometimes an extra liner is used in the bottom of the slot. This is the main slot liner, and it comes. Uh, it's it can be formed like this and inserted by hand. There's hand forming machines and there's automatic forming machines, and and uh, 
this is an example of the cuff liner. That's uh, that's all done by machine. A strip of this stuff goes in a machine and automatically cuts these and forms these and folds these uh, cuffs. Those are little cuffs. You squeeze this together and put it in a slot and it pops out and the cuffs uh, center it and space it up on top of the core like that. So uh, uh, a lot of motor companies these days, they don't even weld the lambs together before they uh, insulate. They, because if you, if you have a set of loose lambs here that are properly aligned, you put the slot liners in and that will uh, hold the core and line it up pretty well. And then you insert the windings and you could skew this core after the windings are put in in a proper fixer and then weld it, the OD as skewed. That's a very popular process for skewing uh, stators for permanent magnet machines. Uh, this is a slot separator. If you have one side of a coil of phase A in here and you have phase B there, this is, is a slot liner, slot separator that insulates the two phases from each other because you might have a plus 600 volts here and minus 600 volts here or something pretty close to that. So you, you have a big potential difference across any adjacent conductors would be touching without this slot liner and this is a, a, a top stick or a, or, a, or a slot wedge that goes in the top. Uh, sometimes these uh, slot liners are made long. Eliminate this and you just overlap them, tuck them, tuck them in here and, and overlap them like this in the, in the slot. Uh, it's very important when you're inserting coils in an insulated core like this that that you don't get any conductors down underneath the slots that happens frequently if, frankly, if you have a bunch of strands you could uh, make a sloppy mistake in insertion on the production line and get a conductor down behind the slot and then you're going to fail in high pot and you have to tear it out and wind it over here's a, a similar arrangement of the same uh, thing as the previous slide we have a thick top stick in this case that's, uh, uh, that's used sometimes to wedge and force these all to touch each other for, for better thermal conductivity and you still have some uh, slot liner material in here to separate the phases. Uh, this is a, another picture of the cuffed uh, core with uh, some of them left out there and the, and the slot liners or cuff liners are laying beside it. Here's an example of the core that's been fluidized, coated with that epoxy, ready to wind. This happens to be a DC armature. <clears throat> this one here is a case of, uh, of uh, molded. This is a nylon, uh, glass-filled nylon piece that goes halfway down the slots and one identical to it goes down the other end of the slots. And so <clears throat> you wind your coils around, around this. This is a uh, stator on the inside, but this could can all be done as a stator on the outside as well. Here's an example of a higher voltage uh, machine that has open slots. See, there's your, your slots are open. And so you have heavy uh, insulation around the outside. And you have a big, thick uh, separator between the two phases. And then it's wound with rectangular conductors that are layered in there. So this is very high slot fill, good thermal uh, situation and uh, 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 in here they insert even insert an RTD in there uh, a, a, a temperature sensor to put in there to measure the the monitor of the winding temperature so it doesn't overheat then uh, there's uh, there there's a temperature rating system that's used around the world and it, I guess it all started in America, it applies to transformers, to electric clutches and brakes, it applies to motors, applies to all uh, uh, electric devices. Temperature rating classes uh, of A, B, F, H. Uh, there's a class C in there somewhere also, but uh, it's not in this list. But uh, here's the maximum allowable temperature for uh, devices that are rated at these temperature classes. The nameplate of every motor is going to have this rating this temperature class on it and uh, these are these are peak 
temperatures in the winding. These are not surface temperatures of a motor, but these are the peak temperatures of the winding, so that you have to use an, uh, an insulation system, class A, class B, class F, class H insulation system that's suitable for withstanding these uh, continuous temperatures. Uh, I don't know if I have a slide here or not, but it's there's an old uh, contention or an old rule that uh, for every 10 degrees in operating temperature of uh, electrical insulation material, you cut its uh, life in half. That's the insulation half-life uh, theory. So, uh, so even with these uh, with these temperature, as long as these aren't exceeded. Uh, you'll get reasonable life out of the machine, but but uh, but it's even better to uh, like in in my case, I will use for most of my customers on designs, I will use uh, uh, I might use class H, I might use 200 degree C or 220 degree C insulation systems, but then I'll rate the machine at 155. I'll rate it at class F, but I'll really insulate it at class H. One of the problems with these insulating uh, systems is I can get varnish, I can get uh, slot liner materials, and all the materials, sleeving, everything can meet the class H. The most difficult thing to meet that is is epoxies. If you use any epoxies anywhere, it's hard to find epoxies or potting compounds that will withstand those high temperatures. There are some ceramic materials that do, and Toyota uses a material like that in the generator of the Prius. Uh, uh, I showed you a picture of it in an earlier slide. It might come up again, but they use that because the stator gets so hot uh, and because it's mounted right on the engine and the transmission case. Uh, there's a, 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 a well-documented, well-known failure mode of stator phase windings when they're driven with inverters. And since uh, we're discussing the design of electric machines that are driven by inverters rather than grid power. We have to bring this subject up and talk about this. What happens is um, if you have a, an electric motor, any of these three motors driven by an inverter, and if that inverter is quite a distance away from the motor, let's say 50 feet or, or further, uh, you, the, the, and, and you control the current with PWM, Remember, the currents are controlled all the way down those leads, so you turn the voltage on and off at some PWM frequency. So the, what this results is is standing voltage waves, very high voltage waves, standing waves that oscillate at uh, PWM frequency in these uh, lead wires, these long cables that go to the, uh, to, to the phase windings. So what happens is that these big, big huge voltage waves, 3,000 volts maybe, 4,000 volts, so you can, on adjacent conductors, if there's any fine little weak spots in the insulation of this conductor and it's close to that one, particularly on the first turn of the first coil of each phase that, that uh, is uh, the coils are out at the end of the Y connection or close to the delta connection. Uh, the, the first turns of the first coils in series for the uh, the phase circuits are subjected to this big standing voltage wave that's transmitted through the lead wires from the PWM inverter. So it causes a big potential across any leakage paths there. And what that does is that uh, uh, that causes ozone and ozone is like acid, it, and the ozone that's created there from the surrounding air causes a very rapid breakdown of this insulation, so you get a turn to turn short from that. The erosion is caused by partial discharges. And general purpose heat in the resistant ramp enamel wire, uh, uh, appearance after inverter surge application tested after applying a voltage of one kilovolt for uh, 11 hours, so so you see it's breaking down the insulation on the conductor. So um, how do you deal with that? Well, that's so if your motor has the inverter mounted a long ways away, you got to deal with this. And the first thing you do is use 
uh, by magnet wire that's been developed that uh, has insulation that uh, resists these failures. These, these insulation materials don't eliminate it. They just increase the life a long time. A lot of motor manufacturers will use this, uh, this uh, inverter duty insulated magnet wire. In addition to that, they will put a, they'll put sleeving, Teflon sleeving around the first turn of the last coil that's connected to the uh, inverter to uh, insulate it against the next turn. They'll, they'll add uh, positive insulation to Teflon sleeving around there. It takes labor, but it's worth doing on an inverter duty motor. The other thing that's done is to completely encapsulate the stator in an epoxy. Uh, a single layer of varnish doesn't quite do it, but uh, uh, another thing that's done is you can do a, a uh, vacuum uh, impregnate system of the stator and you do it two or three times, that'll probably do it, or encapsulate it in epoxy, but use inverter duty insulation wire besides. So that's the kind of uh, caution that's taken for high performance motors with long lead wires that use PWM inverters. Um, these are a description of some of the materials that are used for insulation systems and motors and what the thermal classes are. As you can see there, they're all listed there. The, uh, the uh, 220 degree C rating was always uh, for military, all military stuff is 220 degree C. And the, the image materials that were used for that, like uh, ML varnish and ML wire insulation and, uh, and uh, uh, Kapton tape. Those tapes were all uh, all rated at 220 degrees C, but the DuPont, the company that made a lot of that stuff, they always claimed through their testing that this that these materials ought to be uh, rated at 240 degrees C. And it took years and years and years, but they finally do have re-rated Kapton uh, and uh, ML wire to 240 degrees C, has been my understanding. So, so that's about the highest temperature stuff there is. If you need insulation systems higher than that, and some aerospace need it higher, you have to nickel plate the wire, and then uh, wrap it with this uh, with this uh, uh, Kapton tape. But if you need higher temperature than 240, you have to use a ceramic insulation material, and they have those that go up to to uh, 3,000 degrees. Believe it or not. That's the type of material that Toyota uses in their generator. And there's some really good sources of that, and it's pretty easy to apply. I've used it myself on switch reluctance generators that were assembled inside of a jet engine. This is a, an example of an encapsulation, of a complete encapsulation of a stator. The company that does this is called NCAP. They're really experts at this. They encapsulate, the, their system is used to encapsulate the stator in the uh, uh, the Segway uh, uh, vehicle, most of you know about the Segway vehicle that uh, has all those gyroscopes, and it's a two-wheel personal transport vehicle, and it has two uh, high-performance brushless motors in it, and the stators are completely encapsulated uh, in in the thermal conductive materials by the process by this company, NCAP. This is uh, this particular picture here is a project I work on. This is a uh, uh, a deep sea uh, propulsion motor for a deep sea vehicle that goes down several miles. This motor is made by an American division of uh, Alstom, and uh, this is the, the this thing is assembled with uh, with propeller blades inside of it. It's an outside rotor, a rim brushless motor and all the parts are encapsulated uh, because this has to go so deep in the ocean that uh, it has to completely, there can't be any voids in there as the pressure from seawater will go in the voids inside the stator then when it comes to the surface it will explode from the pressure. But this uh, gives, provides very thermal conduct, very good thermal conductivity from the conductors through this material to the seawater to cool it. And here's a here's an example of a 
of a stator that's been capsulated with this ceramic material. You can see there's the the aluminum housing with the uh, a core fitted in there with all the windings and lead wires in place, and then uh, then it's completely encapsulated with this ceramic thermoconductive material. Uh, this is a picture of a typical mold design to pressure cast a stator by transfer molding uh, to uh, but uh, to 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 completely encapsulate a stator. <clears throat> Let's look at a few of different phase coil types or uh, slots with phase coils. We looked at some of these before. This is uh, the, these two end ones are similar and the two middle ones are similar. The, this is like the first one I showed, but it, it calls out the calls out the components here. This is an open slot form wound coils. This is a semi closed slot with random wound coils, and this is an open slot with form wound coils, the same as that one. Uh, sometimes you have two layers of coils in here, it's rectangular wire. These are the phase separators and the wedges to hold the, hold them in. So a better picture of that. Here's uh, this shows the the steps of insertion and insulation. So you put and this would be a random wound uh, slot open slot with uh, with quite a big slot opening here. So you put the slot liner in. You put the first uh, uh, one side of one coil in. This is a, a lap. These are lap windings where one side of the coil goes in the bottom of the slot. Then so many teeth later, according to the span of the coil, depending on the number of pulls, the other side of the coil goes in the top of the slot. So these overlap like this. And so, but before the second pull is put in, you have to put this uh, this coil separator. And when that's put in, you got to make sure that it doesn't get under. One of these conductors, it's got to be, that's pretty easy for the girls to use. They use a little wooden stick down the slot, a tool to make sure they lower that and get it on top of the windings and that none of these windings creep out over the OD. Then you put the second coil in, then you wedge them in with a wooden stick or a fiber stick like that. Uh, this is a uh, phase, this is phase to phase insulation, which is very important. Uh, under 200, 250 volts phase to phase insulation is usually not required. It's good practice, but I, I would say that uh, 220 volt motors, I would put phase to phase insulation in, but for 110 volt motors, I wouldn't. And uh, in terms of uh, inverters, 110 volt motors, 150 volt DC, and the 220 volt AC motor, w w you have to insulate against 300 volt DC. So. Uh, for higher voltage, the phase coils must be insulated from each other, both in the slots and in the interns. Uh, uh, the uh, it probably between 100 and 250 volts. Uh, you you only need phase insulation in the interns. You probably don't need them in the slots. So. Uh, uh, there's the insulation between the phases and those lots. To, to do this but in the interns, you take a sheet of this uh, insulation fiberglass and you slip it between the phases so you, so you have all of these lapped all the way around the stator and then you trim them with the scissors. You have to be careful trimming them with the scissors so that you can form and lace these interns and keep them as small as possible. They should be pushed in there, and this side here touch right up against the stator core. So there's no chance of any of these creeping down and touching any of those. It's hard to show why you need to do that from a picture like that. Now, the the uh, the form the form wound coils, or the uh, uh, you see how the, each conductor is uh, rectangular, and it's each strand is insulated. Each strand is insulated, and uh, uh, and then the whole bundle of them is also insulated. So this is a a machine that uh, that does automatic taping of form coils, and uh, that are that these are only inserted in open slot uh, stators. 
There's a lot, and uh, they, they some of these are ten feet long, and other ones are only a foot long. So you can tape these by hand, but they have machines that do this. This is like a toroidal taping mechanism, and this is fed back and forth through there as it as it tapes all around. So that concludes this lecture. Thank you very much.